Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. So um, it's not often I say this, but this is a really good day to be a dean. Uh, many of you just arrived, but uh, starting around 2 o'clock, we had the first in a series of um, new faculty presentations. Each was about a 10-minute talk. And uh, four of the six present presenters were uh, from the Graduate School of Education. And I remember why I hired them. It was really, they were really good. All, all six were good, but especially, I especially paid attention to the ones from the Graduate School of Education. Now, it turns out that two of the four people that spoke, two of our new colleagues, are in the fields of mathematics education. And that's really no coincidence and ties directly to um, our distinguished speaker today. And I'm not seeing Carol. Or, oh, this she's. Hi, Carol. <laughs> I was looking for you over there. Um, we actually have a very strong group in mathematics education. And it's in part based on a very strong relationship that we have between the faculty in the Graduate School of Education and the faculty in the uh, SAS Department of Mathematics. And this again ties in a little bit to our history. We've been producing teachers here at Rutgers, New Brunswick, oh, since the early part of the 20th century. And it's been part of our tradition and our culture from that time to the present to, um, to believe that teachers in mathematics or in any, any high school field need to be very well trained in their discipline, at least at the undergraduate level, the BA level. Um, and I like to say that Rutgers was ahead of New Jersey, and New, New, New Jersey was ahead of the nation in coming to this view. And under the Bush administration, the No Child Left Behind Act kind of sort of formalized that. So we had a very strong tradition of professional educators working with content people. And certainly a person who straddles both worlds and does remarkably well is uh, Dr. Carolyn Marr. Carolyn is a homegrown product. She's got all of her degrees from Rutgers University. And I'm very, actually very proud of that fact. It's a wonderful thing. And she's seen herself, you know, so uh, global uh, Jersey roots, global reach. She's got the Jersey roots, uh, and Carolyn presents all around the world. She's asked to present her research all over the world. Carolyn is a professor, too, of mathematics education and the director of the Robert B. Davis Institute for Learning at the Rutgers Graduate School of Education. She currently serves as editor of the Journal of Mathematical Behavior. Her research has focused on the development of mathematical ideas and mathematical reasoning in learners over time and has been supported by over $15 million in grant funding. And that wasn't just last year, I don't think, right? That's over a number of years. Still pretty good. Um, most noteworthy is a longitudinal study that has followed the mathematical thinking of a cohort of students doing mathematics both in and outside of classrooms, now beginning its 22nd year and tracking the students now into their professional positions. So a 22-year longitudinal study of mathematical problem-solving <coughs> really is quite remarkable, but really is a treasure here at Rutgers. The first 12 years of this longitudinal study are featured in the Private Universe Project in Mathematics, a one-hour documentary produced by River Run Media, and a series of six video workshops for teacher professional development that was produced by the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Carolyn's other research includes a three-year study of middle school students in formal mathematical learning in an after-school setting in an urban New Jersey school district. Carolyn recently completed work on an NSF synthesis grant that selected video episodes on children's mathematical reasoning as representative samples from prior studies for inclusion in a prototype of a searchable database accessible via the internet. I think you're going to talk somewhat about that today. Yes. Building on the synthesis work, Carolyn and her colleagues were awarded a four-year collaborative research grant from the National Science Foundation entitled Cyber Enable Design Research to Enhance Children's Critical Thinking Using a Major Video Collection. In this, in this work, they're focusing on teacher education and how studying video episodes of children's learning from prior research can potentially improve teachers' ability to reason mathematically. It's a very interesting mouthful. Having teachers watch children engage in mathematical reasoning and problem solving, how that impacts the teacher's own thinking and ability to, to, to reason mathematically and to teach more effectively, uh, teach mathematics more effectively. In addition, Carolyn is co-PI on a current newly awarded NSF grant, New Jersey Partnership for Excellence in Middle School Mathematics. 
Professor Moore has published over 130 papers with 50, 55 referee journal articles and book chapters. She's given over 30 invited lectures, plenary sessions, and keynote addresses in 12 countries. And she's chaired over 60 doctoral dissertations in her time as Rutgers. Carolyn is deeply committed to doctoral education. She has this intense working group. I'm looking at her husband, Jim. They've hosted them over the years in their kitchen, and in their home, working with, uh, in collaboration with numbers of doctoral students. Uh, she's done important work in the state of New Jersey in terms of professional development and mathematics education. And as you might surmise by my introduction, she is truly a distinguished uh, researcher in the field of mathematical education. Please join me in welcoming Carolyn. Thank you, Richard. That was lovely. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity to talk, and I appreciate the invitation, Dr. Pisani and Richard, for your kind words. And as you'll see, uh, I hope, in this opportunity to talk with you, sort of like inviting a parent to talk about their children, a grandparent to talk about their grandchildren. Mind you, we've known many of these subjects for over two decades, it's just a pleasure to do this. And it's also a pleasure to do it in light of our new collaborations. And you'll hear more about that. There are three parts to this talk. Um, so our, the first part of the talk will focus on the longitudinal research and the cross-sectional research. And um, the second part, it, it's really to show you, to give you some um, little pieces of video data so that you can anchor um, your um, thoughts about the kind of wonderful collection we have here at Rutgers. Um, then I want to talk a little bit more about the longitudinal study following uh, students through their adulthood, which is uh, a new interest of ours. And then finally about our very exciting video mosaic work with, with our various collaborators. Um, but this, this is really an exciting time because it does represent uh, a, a really long life of work, uh, actually a quarter of a century of work. Now when you think about it, I've been at Rutgers this long and doing this work, it just seems like one continuum. And, and the work has been um, truly collaborative. I, I want to stress, um, and as you'll see, that this work no way could, be, could have been done or accomplished without the many colleagues who participated along the way. And colleagues uh, being originally my students when I was sort of here all by myself. So I tell you young people, if you feel by yourself, sometimes alone, uh, remember you have your, your wonderful students as colleagues. And these colleagues can stay with you when they graduate and they continue to work with you and, and so it goes. And that's very exciting. So our work has been involved with research in the classroom setting, in informal settings, in after school settings. And, and it has taken place in uh, several kinds of school districts. We've worked in urban districts. We had two urban districts. We'll talk about those later, but that's Plainfield and New Brunswick. We had the working class district of Kenilworth, where our longest uh, study has taken place. And then the suburban district of Colts Neck. And we did this. Um, really over 22 years ago, as, as Dean DeLisi pointed out. But what's really important here um, to remember is we did this when video wasn't really very popular. So when, when you look at some of the little clips I'm going to show you, notice some of the primitive ways we set up things. Um, and we did this um, really out of our hides because this is very time consuming work. So we amassed over these years a very large collection. We estimate now over 4,500 hours of video data. And uh, that video data, mostly a large part of it, has been digitized over the course of our last couple of grants. Uh, not only have the videos been digitized, but also accompanying work with it, transcripts, metadata, student work. And, um, and then we have this private universe project in mathematics of which we're very excited. You also need to situate this work, because when we started doing it, this was before the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics had their standards. We went into classrooms where mathematics, if we were lucky, was taught daily in elementary schools, and never more than 30 minutes. 
And if you visited those classrooms, the classrooms were conducted in a very much show and tell way. It was very procedural. You had to be fast. You had to be quick. Uh, Dan talked a little bit about that kind of uh, teaching with the example he used. Um, so we we're talking about that kind of a setting and what we were doing early on with uh, my earliest graduate students. Alice is sitting in the audience. She was a graduate student then. Then Judy Landis. We were, we were there trying really to, to show something different, to really show teachers that there could be something else. And what that something else was really changing conditions. Of course, one of the most important and basic conditions at that time was how much time we spent doing mathematics. Um, mind you, half an hour, 45 minutes, we went in there and we said, we'd like an hour and a half. And we don't have to be there every day, but when we go in, let's say six times a year, and a couple of days we're there, we want an hour and a half. And we really need this time. And to show that, teachers wondered at that time, well, would you have enough to do if you had an hour and a half? Can I cover my lesson? And, and they would soon learn that we don't have enough time. So this notion of really more time to do math, opening up so that students would be talking with each other, working with each other, sharing ideas, collaborating, and introducing problems and tasks that were just not modeled. Here's, here's a problem, you do it this way. Here's another problem, you do it this way. But designing tasks that would invite exploration, that would interest students, that would hope to take them as far as maybe they were able to go with the backgrounds they had. And because our work was research-based, we minimally intervened. Of course we intervened. We sometimes said, show us what you did. Can you explain what you did? Um, are, are, are you convinced? Or are your classmates convinced? We intervened often in that way. We intervened by saying, gee, maybe they need an inter another task, because maybe this one, that there's some ideas they need otherwise to explore. So task design was extremely important to us. But we wanted to encourage student understanding by having the mathematics make sense to them. We, we really thought that it should, especially at this very early age, and that it would sort of be a reasonable thing to expect that they could explain and convince others of the validity of their solutions. Our goal as researchers was to study in detail how mathematical ideas and ways of reasoning develop in learners. Now, we've been very fortunate over the years. Um, our work has been supported by uh, five NSF studies and uh, up to our current one. And uh, so I thank the National Science Foundation for its support. But in the beginning, before we had the National Science Foundation support, we were lucky to get support from uh, small foundation money, like Exxon, AT&T, Johnson & Johnson. They, they got us started. You know, we were able to buy little cheap cameras by having them give us some support. It was a beginning. So I tell you young people, you don't have to always start big, but just start, start doing something. And this is sort of an example of the NSF support we've had. The mathematics that we uh, challenge students to consider really what we might, we might say uh, might be characterized as being from a few content strands. Um, there was an algebra strand where students were introduced to early algebra, and that came from the late Robert B. Davis. Um, in his honor, our institute is named the Robert B. Davis Institute for Learning. Uh, we had a counting and combinatoric strand that began right in the very beginning when we worked with students doing problems, really, which was in the second grade. We introduced probability in about the fifth grade, and the pre-calculus calculus strand started uh, in the 11th grade. And in all of these strands, and I'm going to try to show you a little bit of an example, the attention was to student reasoning. And now we, we are going to try to get you excited about the potential of all of this to prepare resources for teacher preparation and development. So, brief project history. Early on when we started doing this, support came from the school districts. We had four partner districts, I named them before. Um, these were Plainfield, New Brunswick, Kenilworth, and Colts Neck. Uh, the NSF funding for our research was about $5 million, which maybe doesn't sound like a lot of money today for those of you who get $5 million grants in one fell swoop. But in those days, a $1 million grant or a $1.2 million grant was a lot of money. Um, and other funding that supported it, Department of Education grants and so forth. 
Um, the work started really in 1984, and as I said, a lot was dependent upon students. 25 completed doctoral dissertations really help us build the data set we have, and there are at least a dozen more that are in progress. So we do have um, the dissertation-based work for this, and we have many publications. I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you a very short uh, minute and a half video. And what I want you to pay attention to some things as you see it. You see these little girls, these, these are second graders. You could see how we had our mics there. You see we put a little cup. Um, and you see the girls are playing with these plastic cubes. I know many of you in the audience know what these are, these Unifix cubes, and they snap them together and they investigate some counting problems with them. Um, but I want you to watch and see if you can identify some of the younger people as they're getting older in the minute and a half that I'm going to show you. So let's take a look at this. Everything you make, you have to check. All right, I'll always make it, you'll always check it. Okay, you make it and I'll check it. I mean, how many other people can tell you the math that they were doing in second grade besides the fact, like, like a word problem, you know? It's not like you were just, like just doing regular problems, you know, it was because that, that's why it leaves such an impression because of the, the depth you get into it, you know. All right, so I've convinced you that there's only eight? Yeah. What fourth grader is interested in math and arguing with their own friends about it? And it just, and we still think this today, like why we sit here and argue about math? It's math. I really don't know like, what happened there that we started arguing, but it's just like got us so far and like what happened was we, we amazed ourselves with the things we got and like where it led us to now. I think that uh, the point of having the kids run the class is because if you tell a, a kid something, they might understand, they might not. But if the kid says it himself, you know, you, you, you get to understand things a lot better if, you know, if you were, if you were running the class. Some of these students that you see in the image here actually came to Rutgers and were Rutgers graduates. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the participants, but I should tell you that at Kenilworth, the focus group, um, there were 13 students, all who applied to Rutgers University and were accepted. This was unprecedented. Maybe from this district, the working class, one or two students would be accepted, but all students came, came to Rutgers. No intervention on my part at all, based upon their own initiative and own records, um, and, and graduated, and so there are other stories to tell. Um, but I just teased you a little bit with a small minute and a half. Um, I'll tease you a little bit more by showing you uh, maybe a four minute, five minute clip. Um, this is one of my favorite clips. Um, we, we've affectionately came to co have come to call it the Gang of Four. These are nine year old children, uh, four of them. You'll see them from left to right. Millen, um, Michelle on the left, and then Jeff on the upper right and then Stephanie and they're talking about their reasoning to a problem um, that is really a very easy problem for them. Easy because they had investigated harder versions of this problem with their partners or beforehand. So the issue was not the hard problem, did they have the solution, they knew the answer to the problem. The issue was to explain their reasoning to each other. The idea of, we talked about explaining, convincing and justifying. So the problem is, you saw these little plastic cubes, they're available in two colors, and they're asked how many three tall towers can they build selecting from those blocks? They, they knew the answer to that. But the, the second part of the most important question was, can you convince each other that you have them? Well, how would you convince them? What would the reasoning start to look like? And in the process is a much longer clip, and I know maybe I'll send you to our repository to look at the longer clip, or even the full 50 minutes of it, but I'm going to come in at the, at the point of, of, of interest here of Jeff, who had been absent for a few days, and he sort of is coming into this a little bit, like what's been going on these last few days, and asked, do you have to make a pattern? Now, notice that the children aren't using these small plastic cubes. They could have. They, they are actually using notations that they themselves have invented and created. I think that's kind of important. I have a question. Do you have to make a pattern? No. no. <laughs> then why is everybody going by a pattern? 
because we liked it. Yeah, it's easier. <laughs> it's easier it's to easier find out. Just going. Oh, there's a pattern. Because if because if you um because if you just keep on guessing like that, you're not sure if there's going to be more. It's easier. Maybe like Shelly and Millen's pattern was to go put this in a different category. I know their pattern. Okay, but what I'm saying <laughs> is it's easy. It's just easier to work with the pattern than to say. Oh, oh, here's another one. Uh, uh, let's yeah, see. That looks good. You might have that in. Because you might have a duplicate, and then you may not know. It's harder to check. Know. It's harder to check just having them like come up from out of the blue. Then just going like this and getting two. How do you one. know there's different things in the pattern? And you can't make any more from this one, so you go on to the next one. All right, and how these, do you know you, you can't make any more from that? Because, because there's not any look, more um, colors. Okay, start here. Yeah, Sorry. Sure. <laughs> start here. Here. Okay, you have the three together. The one, one blue, right? You have the one blue. How could I build another one blue? You, you can't. All right, so I've convinced you that there's no more one blue. All right. But if you didn't have that pattern, it would be harder to convince you. Okay, so I've convinced you that there's no more one blue. Yeah. All right, now we have on. Two, blue. two blue. Here's one, right? Two blue. We have one blue, blue, red. Then we have red, blue, blue. But yes. how am I supposed to make another one? Blue, red, blue. No, this is together. No one she gave me that same argument. She means no, but together. The thing is that does it matter? But I don't know. She means stuck together. Stuck together. That oh. means, like, okay. I, I know. Okay. And then so can I make any more of that kind? No. Then you All would right. have to move to three, which you can right. make then one. No, uh, yeah, you can only make one, and then you can make the three without blue, which is three red. And then you can make two split apart. Yeah. Two split apart, which you can only make one of, and then you, you can find that you can make, you can find the opposites right in the same room. Okay. All right, so I've convinced you that there's only eight. Yeah. Yes. So, so what, what, what's exciting to see how excited they are, how willing they are to talk about their ideas and argue and explain, listen to each other, help each other in that conversation. This notion of the importance of the communication, this was really important to us, to have students be able to be comfortable in sharing ideas with each other. I want to give you another example. There were some handouts when we came in because we weren't so sure about the sound in this one. This is the only clip that somehow isn't coming out stereo. We'll have to look into why it's not, but it's not. But this is a different, this is Cold Snack. This is a fourth grade class. These are nine-year-olds. It's really early in the year. And this was an intervention, a year-long intervention, where um, a former graduate student and I, Amy Martino, were in there for 50 days over the year. Each class was an hour and a half. Now, think about that. That's really sort of unheard of. Um, we're thinking, you know, 15, 20 years ago to have that much time to do math. But what even is more exciting about this is that um, in the fourth grade, uh, students were not really introduced yet to fractions. Fractions were introduced in fifth grade. So students' understanding of fractions was really looking at, you know, um, operator notions, a part of something, you know, a half of something, a third of something, which they knew quite well. But to deal with the, the concept of fraction as number or any of the operations or any of the meanings, that was not something yet that was in their curriculum and that was not something they were exposed to. So in a sense, this became sort of a, uh, an interesting experiment to see what uh, understanding of fractions can they learn when they did explorations with, and, and at that time we used Cuisinier rods, which was a suggestion of the late Robert B. Davis. So using rods as tools, they were doing these fraction explorations over a year. Now, this data set is absolutely amazing. Uh, we have had four doctoral dissertations, and a fifth is scheduled for November 13th, just on this data set, and there's still more data to be analyzed. So it's extremely amazingly rich, and it's going to be wonderful for our repository. But I want you to look at, look at Alan. Alan's nine years old. And Alan and his classmates, this is a whole class, there are 24 students. And they're having, and so, so get a, take a look, you can see in the beginning that there's a whole class here. This is not just a small group. And they're having this conversation about placing fractions on the number line. And Alan is arguing that you can place 
lots of fractions on the number line, and another student is saying, but you don't have any space. If you were, able, if you were going to do this, you'd have to make the space bigger. And Allen argues there's plenty of space. You can divide the line into the smallest of fractions, he says. You could divide it into zillions. You could divide it into zillions, and there would still be space in there. So Allen comes up to show, show his idea. OK, so there's Allen with his hand up. And you can see uh, Allen is invited to come to the board. Hey, number names and all those little lines. Would that be fun? Oh, <laughs> Allen? Up here. No, yeah. it's it would look like you'd see. So, so that means, that, like, you could divide this into halves and thirds and fourths and fifths and all of that. So you're telling me, let me see that I understand this. The rest of you, will you help me with this? You're telling me that this bar over here that's marking zero, right? OK, Michael's making it over there. But this bar that, that's marking zero, you've magnified because you've gotten your very powerful microscope. And so if you're telling me now, if you were, it would be real hard to place, what did you say, 100 or 1,000? 1,000? 100. OK, 100. It would be really hard to see the placement of it, but you may end up, what may look like it's so close to zero, you can't even mark it. Once you've magnified it, you have all this extra space in between. Right. That's it, interesting. Yeah, because it looks like you've got a lot of space, but you really only have that teensy means a bit of space in between there. I mean, you could take like a really small pen and you could divide this up into all those pieces. But that would be really looking at it up that with your regular little, little, little piece up into if you the, look those at it pieces. With your regular eye, you couldn't see that. So you have you'd have to make it bigger. Laura, does that help? This is a, a wonderful session where they start to talk about dust particles and dust bugs and what you can fit here. Interesting ideas in, in the placement of fractions. So one of the strands I talked about earlier was a counting strand uh, we, where we did more and more sophisticated counting problems. And I wanted uh, to sort of jump into grade 10. Um, I know there's lots going on, but I have limited time to talk about all of these. But uh, this, again, is um, a little clip where the students obviously have spent a lot of time thinking about these ideas for much more sophisticated problems. But what's important here is that they are really coming back to using the little unifix cubes again in their discussion. They, they don't use them often. They use them every now and then. But they come because they're trying to explain that there are two problems whose solutions are really equivalent. They're talking about two isomorphic problems. The problem of how many three tall towers can be built selecting from cubes available in two colors. Remember, we looked at this in the fourth grade. And then how many pizzas can you make selecting from three different toppings? And so the towers become a metaphor to explain the equivalence which they connect to Pascal's triangle. And those of you who don't know what Pascal's triangle is, after this I'll show you a little slide to explain sort of what they've been doing. But here they are. There's Ankur, Ramina, <coughs> Jeff, Michael, and then Brian over. And Michael is, by the way, he's a graduate of Rutgers Computer Science uh, graduate. Um, he liked to use binary numbers a lot and binary codes early in his investigations. But Michael is explaining to the other groups how you can think of the pizza problem solution using those block towers. Oh, don't look at the colors. Ah, Just look at so this. You, 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 you I, look I'm at trying the to make sense. Like I'm trying to make sense. Lying down like this. Because it's different. All right, lying down. 
Because then, then you have like this. But this the colors don't specifically represent anything. Yes, yeah. it does. No, it don't. Pop, topping or no top. Let's just say it like that. And if okay. you look at it like this, you know. So all the whites are no topping. Yeah, but then look at each, so each, each is little. It like, yeah. Is it a whole no topping? And this is a this plain is a pizza no with a choice. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, choice okay, okay. Three toppings. Right. Okay, and this okay. would be uh, with a pizza one, with okay, two okay, different one, toppings one. without the, uh, the third no, top. Okay, it's not like a pizza okay. with. No. Two, two top. Oh, yeah. Well, if you're saying this, this isn't a pizza with three no toppings. It's. Just it's just a plain All pizza. right, so that's two toppings. Yeah. That's, that's right. a this, choice right, of so two, yeah. but you have a choice of two toppings. Yeah, so this is so this is choice of two using two. This is choice of two using one. one. This that's is choice using of the other one. Using the other one. one. That's, that's using that's nothing. Yeah. That's, that's all possibilities? Yes. Yeah. Like Those that? are the only possibilities. Oh, yeah. okay. Is that interesting? Okay, well, some of you can think about that uh, problem later. But what, what you're going to see more of is, uh, some of you may recognize this as, as Pascal's triangle, where students uh, were really talking about the row where you see 1331. And that was sort of the row that they were looking at as, as in terms of building towers uh, that contained none of a color, one of a color, two of a color, and three of a color. And so if we talked about one of a color, that meant one topping. If we talked about uh, none of a color, that was all whites, remember? So that was no toppings. And they were exploring this triangle, and more importantly, they were exploring this triangle and how it grew. Um, so you might say, well, how important are these earlier tower ideas to students' mathematical growth? We're now in 11th grade, and the students now have, obviously, um, more mathematical uh, knowledge and skills and different ways to represent their ideas. So now they're explaining why the addition rule works with Pascal's triangle, but they're using the metaphor of pizzas that we just saw with towers to describe um, why that's the case. And choose x um, plus, plus, and choose x plus 1. Equals that. Plus 1 equals that, that right there. So then. Well, that's, that's because this would be gaining an x and going into the x plus 1, yeah. and this would be losing an x. No, no, not, no, no, not, no. not, not getting the same. That would stay the same, and that's, that's it yeah, is an x bad. plus 1. And the top number's going to change because you're going to have more. Because you're going to have more things. More. And why do it is because when you add another topping, like, onto it, this one, say the toppings were 1 and 0, uh, if it gets a topping, that's why it goes up to the x plus 1. And since it doesn't get anything, it'll stay the same. And then this one is staying the same, right? And yeah. it's, that's why it's going there, like saying that's the zero. Okay. And going to there. Okay. Makes sense? Yes. So, Actually, no. so that would be the general addition rule. Okay, so notice, does that make sense? You recognize Jeff from the fourth grade? Uh, why do we have to have a pattern? It's the same Jeff. Um, now, Michael continues uh, to be able to write this uh, in another form, and, Je and, and you're, not, you're not going to hear this really well, but Jeff makes the comment after Michael is finished, can you imagine how intimidating this formula looks if you saw it in a textbook? Minus x plus three, exactly. You know how like, intimidating this equation must be? Like, if you just pick up a book and look at that? Yeah. You do a very carefully check that. You think we're wrong? It is, no, it's right there. Let me think of Where is it? It's right above oh, n yeah. over x. There you go. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I'm sure. You got anything else? <laughs> that took place something like 8 o'clock at night on a Thursday. We often met on Friday in high school, after school. People say students wouldn't come Friday afternoon. They came. Uh, but they had a prom that Friday, so they came the Thursday uh, night before. <laughs> and that was really another exciting session that lasted about two hours. I'm going to show you um, this group, one, uh, one last one, which is uh, a problem that was given to them. This was sort of a pre-calculus problem. Some of you probably recognize the problem as the catwalk problem, where we start with 24 photographs showing a cat first walking and then running. These were the cat photos they were shown. Some of you recognize this. Remember the horse, you know, the Moybridge photos? And the question they were asked is, the interval between successive frames is, uh, 31 hundredths, thousandths of a second. The cat is moving in front of a grid whose lines are five centimeters apart. 
some lines are darker than others. So based on these photographs, can you uh, answer these questions as best you can? How fast is the cat moving in frame 10? How fast is the cat moving in frame 20? Okay. Um, there's a little clip I'm going to show you. It's very short. But Romina is talking about um, what makes sense to her and the need to sort of um, experience the problem. So again, for those of you who know about this problem, these photographs were published in 1883. And the students were asked to um, see what they could do and how would they arrive at their conclusions. It made sense of it. Like, we had the numbers there, but we, they didn't make sense to us. They, we didn't understand how something could change speed so fast, what was going on, why it would change speed so fast. But when you do it like, real, like a real life version of it, you can see what the cat's doing so you understand it. And like our graphs would go up all of a sudden and like fly down. And, but then when we did it, we could see like it was accelerating, it came to a peak, and then it was slowing down. And like it just makes sense of all the math. So some of you in the audience, uh, Arthur remembers, was there watching them do catwalk and uh, Allison. And they actually wanted to act out you know, the motion of the cat, how it feels as they looked at their graphs. And so if you're interested, we have a lot more information about this and more papers. And we have two other dissertations on the way further analyzing these data. So I'm going to go to this other part of the talk before I talk about our repository, which is sort of you know, the icing on the cake of all of this. Um, but we continue to follow some of these students. We bring them in for interviews. And Romina, who, by the way, didn't, who chose not to come to Rutgers, she's a University of Pennsylvania graduate, um, she um, comes in regularly for interviews. And, and this is a, uh, I'm going to share with you some of the things she said as recently as a month ago uh, as part of a doctoral dissertation research of one of our students, uh, Maria DeStefero. Uh, but she says she thinks her group, their little group, she was really impressed by them. She, how did we do that, she says. How did we do what we did? Um, so there's Romina. You know, you can see her um, as a small child, and you can see Romina now um, as a young lady who has just graduated from um, uh, Northwestern's Kellogg uh, Business School. And she's been working at Deloitte & Touche as a consultant. And you can see her as she's working with Brian in the fourth grade with a little towers, but notice in 2009, she has the towers again in front of her. Being a good sport that she is, um, the interviewer asked her about some of the problems she did as a child, so I'll share some of that with you. So Romina, a, a recent graduate of the uh, Kellogg School of Management, um, was interviewed, and her interview sort of falls into two parts. Uh, the first part is really sort of her perceptions, beliefs, how she reflects on her activity in the longitudinal study. And the second part, actually revisiting the fourth grade towers problem. And to show how she revisited this, reconstructing the, the rule algebraically, and also mapping it to the solution of Pascal's triangle. Now, you have to understand, she didn't study mathematics in, in college. She had her you know, calculus that was sort of the last course she took, maybe some business stat along the, way, along the way. But the notion of what she remembers or what she can reconstruct is pretty impressive. So, so Romina, there she is, and uh, you could follow her as to the, where she is today. She says, to this day, if you put the group of us in a room, I think we'd still come up with something pretty good. She says, just to understand where it comes from, to be able to not have thought about it for five years then still recall something about it. I think that's what we did with a lot of these, the way we learned. That was her response to the question, what does it mean to know something really well? She made an analogy to her work in the longitudinal study uh, to business school. She says business school was pretty much this, the longitudinal study, every day in every single class. She said, I had a lot of experience. I did that a lot through this program, growing up with the same 12 people all the time. And at my job, that's what we did. We worked in small rooms with each other all the time. And when she was asked to describe herself as a problem solver, she says, I only get to a certain point by myself by kind of organizing the problem. I like to talk about 
it with other people, kind of like, is this what you think, the issues? How are we going to tackle this? Work on it together. And then come up with a plan. She talks about the importance of bringing people along, solving it together. When she's asked how much time a problem takes, she says, I don't know, hours? Even with us, our sessions were like a few hours at a time, maybe three or four hours, we'd come up with an answer. And I contrast this from a little episode um, in the book Outliers, some of you have read, where they make reference, um, the author Malcolm makes reference to a little paragraph um, about Schoenfeld's study, where, where he um, asserts that students don't want to spend more than a half an hour on any problem. It's usually five minutes before they're willing you know, to be engaged. And we're talking in contrast to students to be willing to be engaged for a very, very long time, where someone is not telling them whether or not their answer is correct, but giving, not, not stealing the opportunity from them for reasoning about it. So she said, we'd always go back and refine it. I think that was what, that's why we'd get to write answers eventually, because we weren't scared, even after four hours, to say, you know what, we need to go back to this. <coughs> So when she was asked what some of her first memories was, she says, those towers, two colors, four high. I don't know if it's my actual first memory, but that's the first thing I remember. And she talks about the way we built on ideas. It was more interesting as we got older, we were able to figure out, go from towers to kind of an equation to kind of a standard theorem, you know. And so there, there she is. In 1992, she's investigating actually five tall towers selecting from two colors, um, and then four tall. But then she was asked again to look at the same problem, and notice she still makes use of those plastic cubes. She comes up with a systematic list. She comes up with an algebraic rule that generalizes her solution to the problem, where you can select from as many colors as you want and build them as high as you want. And then she shows the relationship to Pascal's triangle. And that's in the, I don't know if you can see it, but that's in the bottom um, right corner. So being able to rebuild, reconstruct, connect, connect, and use a variety of representations. Isn't that what we want from students? So she talks about getting to a certain point by herself, talking to people, working on it together. Isn't this what we want people to do now, collaborate, work together, solve problems? Isn't this what really we want to prepare our students for in the future? Well, one last problem. Uh, this problem has been analyzed in great detail by Professor Arthur Powell, who's in the audience. <laughs> and uh, it was given to the students as um, their, their sort of final counting problem. Is that right, Arthur? In the 12th grade. And some of you know this problem, taxi cab geometry. The taxi driver is given a particular territory, and there's the grid. And those are sort of the, the points. Then they were asked, um, they were asked how, how many ways they could get to those points. What's very interesting about this, I'll show you a little clip of them explaining part of their solution. But what's really exciting about this, and I know Arthur and I were very excited when this happened, is that we asked them to solve this problem, but guess what? They solved the general problem. And we said, we didn't ask you to solve the general problem. We asked you to solve this problem. Why did you do that? And they said, well, we knew eventually you would ask us to solve the general problem. Now, aren't these good habits for students? To have them have the expectation to do more rather than the expectation of doing less. We, we took it. We, we broke were, it down. Yeah, we just went from point to point yeah. on the thing. Like we even, we'll just say we started making a box like that. How many different ways can you get from this point to this point, you know, make it easier problem, like the basic math. So we deal. did, like up to this point, there's two. Up to this point, there's three, four, six, three. So that, those are our numbers. Those are up to the points, like down in diagonal. And what we got is Pascal Triangle. Yeah, yeah, we started, you know, and then as we started, you know, like t it takes two to get to there, three to, you know, to get there. So I mean, I just went through and did. And then as we started filling it out, we noticed that if you tilt it like that, and throw ones on the outside and the one on top, I mean, you're looking at Pascal's triangle. And so we stopped at this point because, I mean, making, you know, like 30 plus different things like this, it, gets, it just gets confusing, you know? Mm. And so Brian had, Brian was get like doing, you know, we were, some of us were drawing out all the ways. Brian had another method of finding out the ways to do it, and we just you know, and we just pulled like, it all together. Have. And then that's.
kind of what we're looking at right now. Well, you know, that was kind of nice, but we have two people in the audience now, two graduate students who have been exploring Pascal's Pyramid, and we have them videotaped. We have Robert and Kevin here <laughs> who like to do further explorations. Um, I, I threw the slide in, not because I think you can read it, I know you can't, um, but people always ask me, uh, from this focus group of, of the Candlewords students, where are they now? Um, so what I think is very interesting here is that we didn't produce um, a whole bunch of mathematicians. Right? I think the diversity of, of directions that people went is extremely important. Computer science, business, real estate international, business again, university teaching and research. We have a student here who's getting her PhD. Uh, she did her undergraduate work at Cornell. Um, we have business again, PhD in American studies, um, which is at uh, Columbia. We have finance, we have uh, someone who's in criminal justice. Um, we have one possible math education person here. Only one math major, that's Robert, who handles our whole database here. <laughs> and we have someone who's an auditor um, and a CPA person. So we have a lot of diversity. We have English, we have uh, Angela, who is actually teaching English while she has another full-time job. And I think that diversity is very, very important. Um, people who have really gone and pursued what's been interesting to them and participated in doing this math for a very long time and, and enjoying it. Now this particular slide is, uh, is from my colleague uh, and our, our co-PI on this project I'm going to be talking about, Cindy um, Mellow Silver and Sharon Derry, who's at University of Wisconsin. And uh, C Cindy has been using our videos in her course. Um, which has uh, really sort of different purposes. It's really to look at video cases, and she collects libraries of video cases to teach about certain I ideas and learning, and, and this one was to teach about transfer. And I don't know if you can make, make out what's down here, but that's sort of the work of a little four fourth grader, Brandon, who built an isomorphism between tower and pizza problems as a nine-year-old. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful video. You need to go to the repository to look at it. Um, and, that, and that's sort of um, one use that, um, that, that, that Cindy has been using and, and her colleagues uh, for the video collection. But where are we now? Well, we are really very, very fortunate. Um, we're lucky to have Grace Agnew. She's here. That's been my biggest miracle uh, since this study because Grace has the most amazing um, vision of where we should be going in building this um, repository that's part of RU Core that will preserve our collection and invite both uh, researchers and educators to use it. So we want to preserve this video collection and with the partnerships we form with Rutgers Library here at Rutgers and with Sharon Derry at the University of Wisconsin who is also a, um, a PI on this project, um, we are engaged in two, two pieces. One is the building of this repository and the other to use it to do a quasi-experimental study which asks the question, um, if teachers study children's uh, reasoning on, from the video, will they better be able to recognize it when they see it? Uh, it's sort of the notion of and the importance of students' reasoning and the importance of, of, of students' uh, problem solving and thinking has not been stressed maybe as much 15 years ago, but today it's important. It's a very important NCTM standard. And we need to shift our attention to the importance of recognizing it, recognizing if the reasoning is correct or not, valid or invalid, what's the kind of reasoning, and, and that's part of what our study is about. So we're doing this with, in a collaborative research environment uh, with uh, uh, with Grace, uh, with Cindy, and with Marjorie. Um, so we're doing this through uh, our grant, which, which is a video mosaic. And what is it? It's an innovative, interactive digital environment that's supposed to be supporting our video-based uh, program. And um, we're preparing to do our study at three levels, elementary, middle, and secondary. We've been engaged in a big series of pilot studies over this last year and a half. And this has as a consequence the production of a tool for ongoing collaborative research um, and introducing this, this very new exciting VMC analytic. So what is the video mosaic analytic? 
Well, it is a, is a tool for the next generation. It's an annotation tool, an analysis tool for education. It can serve a lot of purposes because it, it is a part of the open source repository architecture that will enable us to transform what's a, a discovery environment into an interactive and collaborative one. So that practicing teachers, faculty, researchers, teacher educators can work together can integrate video into the teaching and learning process, and can also conduct ongoing analyses of video data. Now, I said this earlier, and I'll repeat again, our collection alone is, is, is enormous. 4,500 hours of video data spanning more than 20 years from longitudinal and cross-sectional studies. It's not just the video data that we have that's digitized. We have our student work. We have wonderful transcripts. We have field notes, we have many related publications, abstracts, journal articles, and as I said, dissertations and more in the making. And we have looked at some of these in terms of video cases, in terms of reasoning, where we've looked at reasoning by cases, induction, contradiction, upper and lower bound, analogy, just for example. So, so given this incredible wealth of material, which as you see these lovely videos, uh, what, are our, what are our goals here? Well, our goals are to build and share these teacher education and teacher professional development interventions using this video collection in, in a design research study. Now, one element that's very exciting uh, that, that Grace has introduced to us is this, this idea of a workflow expression. Um, if you were to say, how should you use these? How should you go in and use these videos? What, 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 what is the best way? Well, we really don't know. You know, we have, we have uh, uh, teacher educators, and we have people who work in teacher development, and we have these tools. What we need to do is study how they use them. And when we study how they use them, we can feed that back, and we could learn from, in our design research, we can learn from what we do by studying their use. So we want to capture and analyze these workflow expressions, which we're doing now. And, and by the way, I think there's, there's a doctoral dissertation from University of Wisconsin that is focusing on this little piece of it, so that this could guide the next iteration of interventions so that we could build a database of replicable interventions. So by building this video mosaic repository, we'll be able to preserve the videos, associate them with analytics, which means that, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but that means People from the outside could come in and look at our videos and analyze them, and that can become part of our collection. So we provide this collaborative environment, and we, we link the annotations with the videos and also the associated resources, which gives us flexibility, and it can be customized for individual use. So our new analytic tools, in summary, we can search for and view videos, we can provide brief abstracts of the annotations, and we can display the records from the search. So it might look a little bit like this. I showed you a little bit of Brandon earlier because that was the one that uh, Cindy used. But there's an early draft of an analytic tool. So you, you get to watch the video. You can, you can get to pull up the transcript if you want. You can get to pull up the related work if you want. You could search in a variety of ways. You know what piece it is. But there's a tool here also if you're a student and you were asked to maybe investigate how a particular idea was built you actually, there's a tool in there that could actually take little chunks of video and you can create your own video to tell your own story. And so you can, you can tell your story in video, you can tell your story as a Word document working really with transcript. So what we have here is, if you think of this as our analytic repository, the video object, you can think of this as the actual video, the original source video. From the video, we have many students who study these videos and collections of them, a dissertation, or researchers working to study and write papers and study some particular question they're interested in. The dissertation then becomes one of the analytic units. Okay? Now, it's very possible that someone could use either that same video or a different collection of video with a different lens and produce a different analytic unit. Or other analytic units can grow from the outside because now Pablo is very interested now not just with undergraduates and graduates, but now he's interested in maybe pre-K and he wants to see if some of the things he's interested in he can still study with a different population. So that becomes another way to um, to use the video mosaic collaborative. 
So we, we have lots of examples. You know, we have, uh, you can see that th there'll be sort of a record of this is when it was created, this is sort of what it's about, this is the in intended audience. So you can search by a whole vector of, of uh, um, possibilities. You can look age, grade, topic, etc. So these are just some more examples of how you might do this. Um, so the, the, the range of topic is enormous when we start to talk about our informal math learning grant. So you, you can pull up, you'll pull up something that looks like this, will be your brief description, and uh, you'll be able to even search some more. So cyber-enabled video mosaic for teacher education enables us to do systematic design research. Right now, we have several research sites in New Jersey and an online site in Wisconsin. We are currently analyzing workflow expressions in our two sites this, this actually semester. And we're investigating how different sites adapt instructional interventions. We have already done pilot studies. Uh, we have two partner institutions working with us. We're working with uh, Seton Hall University, and we're working with uh, Felician College. And uh, Montclair wants to join us, but we have to go through IRB to include them, because that's after the fact. Um, we have, uh, in pre-service, we're working with elementary, middle, and secondary pre-service teachers. For in-service, we are working in an urban and suburban district with elementary and middle level teachers. Our project timeline is, so far, we've um, done pilots at these sites. We've been collecting pilot data. We've been developing instruments. We've been developed rubrics for analysis. We've analyzed some of our data. And our big study is next year. So looking ahead, this repository-based cyber infrastructure is going to support the research we do, and we hope the research of many others. It also will provide a long-term preservation access and web portal customiza customization, um, builds relationships among the research objects. You can pull a published paper that's related to it, a dissertation, presentation. Um, PowerPoint um, for search and display, um, and participation in, in designing of tools that benefit any research that's stored there. RU Core is the big, big um, idea for Rutgers Community Repository. We are a piece of that big idea. And, and the good news is that by having us as part of the collaboration, we are gaining from the big idea, and we hope that we can offer something to the big idea to learn from as well. So thank you very much. And thank you to all of those who have helped uh, in many, many ways to uh, enable me to have the privilege of giving this talk. Thank you. We were very lucky because we started before um, when it was easier. <laughs> and uh, when, because we started when it was e easier 20 years ago, um, and all the questions about videos and all were really not issues at that time, it was very easy to get permission. And we continued to get permission. So uh, I think being at the right place at the right time helped us. And once we moved along, it was not so hard. I think it's harder to do if you were starting to do that today, certainly. So it's a very valid question. Any other questions? Carol, so we hear so many criticisms about high stakes testing uh, in K-12 education in particular. And people argue that the assessments don't really assess, in the area of mathematics, for example, don't do such a good job of assessing reasoning. So what have you learned in your, your, your two plus decades of work about mathematical reasoning and how it might be assessed or measured? Well, the measuring and the assessment of it is what we're working on now. Yeah. That's hard. And we, have, uh, and we have quite a strong team helping us with this. It is hard to do. Uh, unfortunately, it's not so that the tests are so bad. I mean, if you look at the tests, we often say, 
students should be able to do this. That's not so much the issue. The issue is they don't. And I think part of the problem is what I, one of my colleagues from Australia termed as cognitive theft. We have really taken away from students you know, the empowerment of them to believe that they could do it and are willing to do it. They sort of play the game of waiting us out. You know, if I wait long enough, you're going to show me how to do this. Um, and and it's, it's, it's the question of empowerment and, and not the investment. The tests aren't really the bad guys. It's the confidence we've taken away from students and what we've asked them to be able to learn how to do. Um, interestingly enough, um, as we were in, in the study in the midst of it, uh, standardized tests were very, very popular in New Jersey. Uh, and we uh, monitored the students in terms of their performance on these standardized tests. And then, if you recall in those days, the, the, the test had three areas. It was computation, concepts, and problem solving. Now, when we moved to focus on problem solving and conceptual understanding, um, you would think that computational skills would really decline. They actually didn't. Computational skills stay the same, and that was what they did best before we came in. But there was very, very significant growth in conceptual understanding and problem solving. So I, I, don't, I don't really think um, it's a question of the tests aren't the bad guys. It's what becomes now the priority in schools and the classroom is the teaching to the test that's so bad. Well, yeah, there are always those difficulties. I think, um, I think um, from my overlook, looking back over the years I've been doing this, um, I find that um, folks have to find out for themselves that it doesn't work to do it the other way. It doesn't work to just you know, teach them to the test and tell them and show them. Um, the teachers themselves get very, very frustrated that this isn't working and then they become desperate to try new things because they care they want their students to learn and then they start to branch out a little bit and there are different ways they choose to do this you know it, it may be that they, they do lecture mostly but they build in these problem-solving strands that they encourage students to work together in groups and and, and I know that's a problem I mean I, I somehow you have to build in and form that culture where it's valued because once you do it and once you model some of it I, I think when someone is hooked, then it, you don't go back. You know, I'm, I'm saying I think you can only then go forward. But it's very hard to break that culture and those expectations. I don't know if I've answered your question. Okay, any further questions? All right, well, I'd like to thank our speaker very much for very... Thank you. Thank you.